everyone who is alive today, and I think that includes everyone in the room, looking around quickly, everyone who is alive today is the result of at least two equally important events. That's birth and growth. See, if you think about it, you are the result of a physical birth. And that was followed, I'm sure, by physical growth. And it's the same story, really, if you think about it in the spiritual realm. If you're a follower of Jesus here today, if you have faith, you have experienced what the Bible calls a new birth, a spiritual birth. And if you'll turn there on your page to 1 Peter chapter 1, and let's look at it together, verse 3 specifically, it says this in verse 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has begotten us again. Your translation, if you have the NIV, says, given us new birth, just to make it real clear, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, again, at some point in your physical life, if you put your faith in Jesus, the result was what it says here, a living hope. A living hope because we serve a risen Lord. See, that's the spiritual life. When that spiritual birth takes place in a person's life, well, that's an important point. But it's also important to point out that the Christian life is not just about that new birth. You know, that's not all she wrote. See, it's also about new growth. And so whether it's in the physical area of life or in the spiritual area of life, Not all growth is automatic or easy. You know, sometimes there's those growth spurts that you don't even know how they happened. But other times, well, it's not quite that simple. See, in fact, some growth is downright painful. And that's why I titled today's teaching, Growing Pains. Because with growth comes, often, growing pain. See, growth, it's a process there of stretching, of straining, of bending and breaking sometimes the very pain there of progress. And spiritually speaking, it can take a lot of grinding to grow. You know, God can put you through that spiritual meat grinder, so to speak. And if, if we look at 1 Peter, if we think about his life for a moment, we will see that painful growth process was very evident in Peter. See, the apostle Peter is a man who grew a lot spiritually. And you would say, of course he did. He's an apostle, right? But the thing to remember is that the apostles were just people, that they were just people that God got a hold of there. And we first meet Peter in the book of Matthew. That is the first book of the New Testament. We won't go there now, but just know that that's the first mention of this person, Peter. But now you see toward the back of the book, that's his book that he writes, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and there's a lot that has happened in his life. He has changed, he's matured, he grew, and the thing is, it's a painful process, and it's, it's great because in the Bible, it's recorded. You get to see his process. You get to see his mistakes. You get to see his mishaps. You get to see his failures. They could fill many chapters, and they do. But see, out the other end of that spiritual meat grinder, well, guess what? We get Peter, the leader. See, we get an example. We get an inspiration. And sometimes people say, well, I don't want to be an inspiration if that's what it takes. But remember, the inspiration he gives us, we're going to read it here in 1 Peter 2, verse 2. So if you go skip down to that, you're going to see this verse, such an important one to know. We'll talk about it more today in context, but this is the idea. This is the big idea of today's teaching if you want to think it through and write it down. 1 Peter 2, 2, it says that you as newborn babes... Desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. See, I love that phrase, that you may grow thereby. It's saying there's something that gives growth to a baby, which is not physical milk, but spiritual milk. It says the pure milk of the word of God. See, Peter didn't want his readers to just stay big babies. You know, it's kind of sad when somebody does that. He wanted them to grow. See, Peter knew all about growing pains, though. He knew it would be a painful process, and he says there is a way that you can grow thereby. What is it? It's the Word of God. See, Peter's able to speak from personal experience there and say it was the Word of God that changed his life. And not just pages there, the person. See, the Bible says 
that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus, the walking word of God. And so if God can do it for Peter, he can do it for you. That's the thing that you can hold on to today. Now, if you will look closely at the slide that's up here, you will notice that it's an x-ray image. And if you have decent eyesight there, you can see that it's a broken leg supported by pins and wires. Now, this is actually a picture of our son Stephen's leg that was taken immediately after a surgery he had in March of this year. See, Stephen is having his leg lengthened and strengthened. Now, right away, you might say, ouch, and that would be a good response. See, he was born with one leg that was quite a bit shorter than the other. And from birth, we knew that there would come some growing pains in his life. Specifically, we knew that his bones would come to a point where they would stop growing prematurely. See, and they would need some encouragement to keep growing beyond that point. See, to his full potential, if he was going to reach it, there would have to come some growing pains. And talk about growing pains. This is how it happened. A surgeon was paid a lot of money to break the two bones in the leg there of Stephen and to put some metal rods and wires into that, into the bone, to screw those into the bone and put them actually all the way through the leg. Now, for the first six weeks after that surgery, this was the fun part, we had to turn screws in that apparatus every day and that resulted in just the right amount of lengthening of his leg. Now, after the lengthening came the strengthening. See, that is one of those things that you think about and you say, oh, at least it was over quick, right? Well, not exactly. See, Stephen tells me this is the most painful part of the painful parts, which is eight more months for that new growth, that new bone growth to fill in the gap and solidify enough that that brace can be removed. And so that's a painful process, certainly, with slow progress. And you might say, hey, you know, spiritually, I can kind of relate to that in some ways. See, one medical journal called this an excruciating test of the upper limits of human endurance. See, the next couple of slides here show the gap growing between the bone ends, if you look at it. The first one, just the little break there, that was taken right after the surgery. And then the next one you're going to see after some of the lengthening process after those screws have been turned there's a greater gap in there a growing gap and then the last picture is going to show an even greater gap growing there and in that a little haze not a purple haze that's something different <laughs> but there's a little haze growing in that gap hopefully nobody's still in the purple haze that, but <laughs> there's a there's a haze in there and as the doctor put it by faith that is the growth that is occurring in the bone. Now, these are some older pictures, and I didn't have the most recent ones that are showing even more, more, more growth in that area. And so we encourage you to keep praying for him as uh, we're going to the doctor even in a couple weeks for another x-ray. But this is new bone growth here. And I, you know, some of you, I can see you even wincing through this thing. I didn't show the color pictures. I have mercy on you for that. We have a whole bunch of really cool pictures, but they're a little bit too graphic. So if you're into that sort of thing, hey, stop by afterwards. I'll show them to you, you know, and, and Stephen here can even show it there in person. But what do these x-rays have to do with First Peter? Well, I'm hoping in some way it's a very memorable picture for us that we can always remember this main message, which is life is not just about birth, it's about growth. And both can be painful. I mean, ask your mom whether birth is painful. But growth, hey, that can be pretty painful too. See, encouraging you here to keep growing, keep going forward, even when there are some growing pains in your life. Now, some of you are saying, Pastor Scott, you don't have the gift of encouragement, man. You have the spiritual gift of discouragement, man. You are not encouraging me to want to grow. You are discouraging me from growing. But please, stay tuned today. See, I think there are some encouraging thoughts on growing pains, on the purpose of pain, because everybody, whether you want to or not, whether you choose to or not, you're going to go through some pains in your life, and you can either grow from those things or not. And so there's some lesson learns, I, I believe, from the physical to the spiritual in this surgery here. God used this experience of this surgery to encourage me personally 
through the inspiration from my own son to keep growing and see to teach me some lessons about the courage it's going to take to keep growing sometimes through the painful process of progress. Now, the passage, again, that we will look today at is from 1 Peter. And this whole book, if you'll look at it later, and I'd encourage you to do so, it's a book that's about triumphing over trials. It's a book about heading through those hardships, but actually learning from them and growing from them. It's not just going through some adversity, it's actually growing through that adversity. That's God's plan and purpose for us. See, and I think about God's perfect timing in it, which is the very section that we are studying here today, the very part that we are looking at. Well, that happened to be where I was reading in my own devotional time when we were at the hospital. I'm right here in 1 Peter reading this section as we were going through all of this back in March. And so two days after the surgery, what happened was that the doctor came in, the surgeon came in, it's kind of funny, he came in with a bunch of tools like craftsman tools, weird things, you know, to make adjustments. And I was like, wow, he looks like a mechanic more than a, uh, you know, than a, a surgeon. But, it, but he did his job there, and one of the things he did is he brought in interns with him, you know, students in with him, and was explaining a bunch of this stuff to them. Now, he gave a full description of Stephen's problem, of the solution that they were doing here. And so he was talking about birth defects. He was talking about growth defects. He was talking about growth plates and infection and all of these things and all the stabilization and how this thing worked. Now, mind you, I hadn't had sleep in a few days. And I had slept on that couch that they intentionally make as painful as possible, you know, at the hospital. So I guess you'll leave. I don't know why they do that. But they, they search. You know, they don't go to Ikea where there's some nice, comfortable furniture. No, they, like, go and say, hmm, that's a torture chair. We'll put that in all the rooms, you know, but that way you can relate to whoever's suffering in the hospital bed. But I, I had kind of been sleep deprived and all the rest of this, but this seemed very profound to me at the moment. I'm hoping it'll still be profound here today. But it was the connection between the physical lessons this surgeon was giving and the stuff I had just been reading in 1 Peter chapter 1 and 2. What a parallel there was there. And so... What I want you to see here about birth, about growth, about some of these things. Well, if you look at the very first word of 1 Peter chapter 2, here's what you're going to see. It's the word therefore. Therefore. Now, anytime you see the word therefore, you've got to ask yourself a question, which is, what is it there for? Well, it's there to point to what came before, right? Because it's a word that points backwards. And so pointing back to what came before, let me just back you up. Put you in reverse for just a moment here. In chapter 1, verse 22, the last few verses there in chapter 1, what is it talking about? It's talking about birth. I'll read it with you here. Verse 22 of chapter 1, it says, Some, since you have purified your soul in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Here's that phrase again, verse 23. Having been born again not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And then he goes on to contrast the eternal word of God with the not so eternal world. It says, because all flesh, that's us, is as grass for all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, its flower fails away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. So what is Peter saying there? Well, he's talking about that birth process, how it happens. And contrasting that physical birth, which is through the corruptible seed, with the spiritual birth, which is an incorruptible seed. The word corruptible, it just means flawed, messed up, corrupted. See, the physical life of man, it just says it right there. We wither and we die. Now, we can try to deny this process. You know, I, I like the way Pastor Pedro puts it. He says, you may have an hourglass figure, but the sands are going to shift. I mean, that's just, you know, over time, the sands are going to go through that hourglass a little different. And you can try and prop it up, or you can kind of cut it off, or whatever, but the incorruptible seed is the only thing that isn't ever going to change. See, the corruptible seed, the physical life, well... 
There's going to be some growing pains as we even growing old. See, the word of God lives and abides forever, though. Now, if you're taking some notes, these are the things that that doctor was saying, and I wrote them down, so I kind of plagiarized him, but hey, after the bill that they sent us, I suppose, you know, this is the least he could give us. So, the word, the word of God, what does it do? It corrects defects. Corrects defects. See, that's what God's word needs to do in our life, correct defects. I don't know if you know this, but you have some defects. I'd be happy to point them out to you. But I probably don't need to. Maybe you already know a lot of them. See, spiritually speaking, we were all born with a deadly defect. The Bible calls it sin. You know, people try to call it syndromes. You know, I have a syndrome. No, you have sin. That's the truth. (laughs) See, it's a defect so deep, so drastic, that the only way to correct that defect, the Bible says, is to be born again. It's like God says, "Eh, hit the reset button. we got to start this one over. And so to start over with a new heart, a new start, a new mind, a new life, what a wonderful thing that is. I love the reset button. You know, my kids like to play video games, and every once in a while I admit I do too. But if you get off to a terrible start, red button, you know, reset, you know, reset every regret, everything that I've done wrong, and get a new start. That's what God says we can do. Because we were all born with a spiritual birth defect, a corruptible seed, the Bible calls it. We wither, we fade. See, that's the problem. What's the solution? Well, we must be born again, the Bible says. Not of something corruptible, not of something temporary, not of something physical, but something incorruptible, something eternal, something spiritual. See, and we have there what the Bible calls a spiritual rebirth. How does it happen? By believing and putting our trust in the Word of God. And again, not just the pages, the person behind the pages, the author and finisher of our faith, the Bible says. And so so often that word, I think, somewhere along the line got kind of hijacked, and sometimes it can be kind of strange. Like people talk about born-again Christians. You know, is that guy a born-again? Is he one of those born-agains? Well, that's usually a, a... you know, short way of saying, is he one of the weird ones? You know, is he one of the fanatics, one of the crazy wild-eyed ones, you know, that just kind of want to hit me over the head with it or something? No. See, Jesus was the one who said those words first, and he was anything but weird. But he said, you must be born again. You must come to a new, fresh start. I mean, when you put it that way, you understand it maybe a little differently. But there really is no other kind of Christian. You know, it's not like a special brand of them called the born-again types. No, you either are born again or you're not. And the Bible says if you are not, well, then you're really not a follower of Christ. See, we don't have eternal life naturally. We don't come by it physically. Our parents can't give it to us as much as they might like to. But God gives it to those as a free gift to those who ask him. And you'll have an opportunity, if you've never done that, you'll have an opportunity to do that here today at the end of the service. But you see what he talked about there in verse 25, the gospel preached. Now the gospel means good news, but there's also some bad news inside the good news. I don't know if you uh, have ever heard somebody say, hey, I've got good news or bad news, which one do you want? Well, I'm like, Just the good news, thanks. You know, why does it have to be this and then that? Why can't we just leave the bad news out? Well, we really can't. See, the bad news is we are sinners. We have a defect, born with a fatal flaw, a heart defect. You know, the heart, the Bible says, is deceitful and wicked. You know, we say, oh, they have such a nice heart. and That's not what the Bible says. He says, you have a messed up mind. You know, you have thoughts that if we were to put them up here on the screen, you'd go, oh, could you take that down, please? You see, we need a transplant. We need a new heart. We need a new mind. And the good news, in light of that bad news, is that the word of God corrects defects. That's what he's promised to do in our life, to anyone who comes to him. For me, it was in 1993. At the age of 27, I'm now 43. But God is still correcting defects. See, for you, it may be today that you come to that birth process, that moment, that point where you say, hey, I want to start growing spiritually. Put your faith in Jesus. See, that was 93 for me. But again, I have defects. It's not the end. It was the beginning of growth. See, after there is birth, 
then there is followed by that growth. So important to see those two. So many people get so hung up on the birth thing spiritually, but what about the growth thing? See, that's real important too. It comes as a shock to many Christians, I think, that even after we are born anew, born afresh, and have this experience with the Lord, well, that we still have defects. You go, oh, we do? I thought he was going to take all those away. Now, see, we make the choice to follow Jesus, but that's where the process of progress changes and starts. We are immediately given new life, like that, in God's eyes. But there's still some defects to correct. See, let me use the analogy this way. By God's grace, our son Stephen, he was not born with a life-threatening defect. You know, that can happen. But he was born with what I might call a growth-threatening defect. See, we could have left his legs uneven, but we wanted even Stephen, see? Now, that would have caused other problems. Now, the, this is one of the things you learn in life, too, is that sometimes problems get worse over time. See, as a kid, you can run around on one leg. You can just do whatever you want to do. But after a while, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but one little thing off, and all of a sudden, everything's off. And the longer you're like that, the more out of whack you get. And so we needed to even up Stephen. And the type of growth that he was going to have, was going to take courage. See, again, it wasn't just going to be automatic. It wasn't just going to happen, you know? Some of the bones in his body were going to have to be encouraged to grow. And it wasn't going to be easy, but it was going to be worth it. See, in your own life, there's going to probably come that point too. See, in, in the Christian life, so often, there's some like easy early growth, the way I call it. You know, just kind of that baby growth stuff where it's like, hey, I'm growing. I don't even know how I'm growing. I'm just growing. Yeah. And then you all of a sudden hit some kind of plateau. Bong, and you go, wow. I don't know how to grow past this point. And God says, well, I know how to grow past this point. See, again, so often in those early times, it's like, well, I'm forgiven. I, 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 I've given my life to him. I'm heaven bound. And, and hopefully we never get away from the joy of that. But practically speaking, there's some times in my life where God says, you know, there's still some unevenness there. There's still some brokenness there. There's still some stunted growth there, and I'm going to have to do an adjustment. You go, an adjustment? Is it going to hurt? You may feel a little pinch. Don't you hate when doctors say, feel a little pinch? You're like, no, this is a little pinch, doc. What you just gave me was not a little pinch. See, and maybe some of you in this room right now are at that point where you're feeling pinched, you know, in your Christian world. You've been born again, as the Bible says here. You know you're forgiven. You know you're headed to heaven. You know what the Bible says on those things. But you know, you know what? I think I'm about to go through a season of growth. So I maybe hit that plateau, and, and I want to keep growing. I want to keep going. And you say, but it's, it's going to hurt, isn't it? It's going to hurt some, isn't it? I don't know how to grow past this point. And God says, well, I do. See, at that point, that's when we need to trust the spiritual surgeon. That's what God is in our life. He's the one who comes in and says, there's still a bit of work to do. And so he has that ultimate set of tools. You know, He can fix it. When you look at your life and say, I don't know who's going to fix this mess. God says, I can fix it. But sometimes he'll put us in a fix to fix it. See, God's work in our life, his word in our life, well, it's both a point and a process. I think that's so important to see. Again, that point for me, 1993, I can point back to that and say, God entered my life in a real and radical way. But it's still a process, and it'll be a process until the day I go to be with him. See, the point is birth, the process is growth, and God wants both in our lives. God doesn't want to just whisk us away instantly to eternity. You know, you would think, hey, that'd be a great thing. You know, I come to faith in him, and what happened to Scott? Well, he's gone. You know, he became a Christian today. Oh, really? He disappeared? Yeah, no more pain for him. No more growth. God's just going to whisk him off to eternity. See, that brings us back to 1 Peter 2, verse 1 here. The work, the growth process. See, look at verse 1 with me. It says, therefore, having been born again, remember, that's what it says, Laying aside all malice, and I like malice. It's the way I do things. All deceit. I've always done things that way. 
Lie my way through life. You know, hypocrisy. Act one way in one situation, another way in another. Envy. You know, looking around, seeing what everyone else has got and why I don't have it. Evil speaking. Well, what will I have to say? <laughs> I'll run out of words. He says, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow there by, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So I want to review that first point for you real quick, which is that the word of God corrects defects. And the second one, this is what it does. The surgeon, again, talking in that room, gave me this point. The infection inspection. Now, he didn't rhyme it like I do, but, you know, he's a surgeon, not a preacher. So the infection inspection. See, one of the biggest dangers in Stephen's surgery, that type of surgery, is the risk of infection. You know, if you're one of those germ-scared people, you know, that kind of thing, well, this would certainly bother you. Open wounds for about a year. Oh, man, like 15 of them. Okay, so bacteria, you know, microscopic little menaces there. They delay that growing process. They will actually endanger it if we don't take care of his legs. So the surgeon spent a lot of time that day in the room while I'm half asleep giving me all the procedures for taking care of the leg. And I'm thinking, I wish Lynn was here because I want her to do this for the next, you know, however many months. I don't want to do this. I'm kind of a squeamish person, actually, the truth is. But I'm getting, I'm growing. I've, I've gotten to the point where I'm like, eh, it don't matter anymore. You know, God has really helped me in that area. But this is what God's word is teaching us there in verse 1, is that God wants to do an infection inspection in your life. Why? So he can find fault with you? So he can point the finger at you, oh, you're still messed up. So many defects. No. So he can correct the defects so he can keep those things that would hurt us at bay and stunt our growth. Do you want to grow spiritually? Do you want God's surgery to be a success in your life? Well, I can say it this way. Keep it clean. All malice, it says, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, evil speaking, that stuff's just got to be laid aside. See, all those words in verse 1 are really heart issues. You know, they're the things that come out of who a person really is. Sometimes someone will say something like, well, I just said all that mean stuff. I didn't mean it. And you go, well, the Bible says something different than that. It says, how the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And who you really are will come to the outside because of what is inside. And so God is wanting to get those things purged out of our lives. See, when you think about wounds, well, I'm sure in this room there are some people who have been wounded by the words of others and maybe wounded some people with their words. And so it says here that you can have some shortcuts in the spiritual life and say, well, I'll just let that fester. But see, the danger of infection in your life is that it'll stunt your growth. It's going to hurt you. See, a lot of times people say, I'm not going to forgive that person. They don't deserve it. Well, forgiveness really isn't freeing them so much because they're free whether you forgive them or not. It's freeing you. It's freeing you to grow. See, Psalm 119 talks about the word of God, and I'm just going to quote one part of it. It says, how does a young man, or for that matter, an old man, keep his way pure? He says, I will hide your word in my heart. I'm going to hide your word in my heart so that it's a part of my heart, so that God's way of doing things, God's way of seeing things is part of me there. See, the pure milk of the word, it builds bones. So I would ask you, hey, got milk? Got milk? <laughs> and there's also meat in here. That's the great thing. It's not just milk. It builds bones, and the Bible calls it the washing of the water of the word, just that cleansing process that happens. And you might not even know it, but see, with Stephen, we have to do this regularly. It's not just a, oh, we did that once. <laughs> no, we have to continually keep it clean. We have to watch it carefully. And so the infection inspection, remember, corrects defects. That's what God's word does, the big stuff. But then the small stuff in our life, those microscopic messes that mess us up so often, the things inside that maybe others wouldn't see. And then you see the last thing I want to share with you in these terms here is the Word of God brings that stability ability. The stability ability. Now, there's a lot of unstable people in the world, but God's Word brings a stability. If somebody thinks they believe in God's Word and they're unstable, well, see, God's word actually is the thing that builds us up and gives us stability. See, the flesh won't hold you up. I mean, imagine, we used to have a little song that the kids would sing when we were kids. It was from uh, Sesame Street, but it says, without your bones, you'd be all sloppy. 
You know, and if you think about you without bones, you'd just be like, Ugh. and that's how people are without the word of God in their life. Just kind of blown by the wind, anything goes, mushy. You know, if the crowd is going that way, well, I guess I go that way. If the crowd is going this way, I go back that way. You know, but stability ability. And it's such a wonderful thing when you know God's word is speaking to you. See, when I think about this, I do lots of hospital visits over my pastoral ministry. You know, a lot of times there, even when people are suffering or even dying, and they never ask, hey, could you read from today's paper for me? Hey, could you read that Cosmo magazine over there for me? No. They say, could you read God's word for me? That's what people need. Stability ability. To read the purpose of pain. To see that God isn't hurting us, but helping us. The pure milk of the word, again, good for the bones. Now, this is a huge truth coming here. This was the one that hit me the most that day in the room. It's really having to do with the stability ability. You can picture the interns, you know, all with their little notebooks, and hopefully you have one. I had one that day, and I wrote this down. The surgeon asked them some questions, and he said, when a bone has stopped growing, there's only one way to promote new bone growth. Do you know what that is? And they're all like, now. He says, you have to break that bone. See, new growth only occurs in the broken places. Now, I hope in some way that hits you not just physically but spiritually. New growth only occurs in the broken places. So often we look at our life and say, man, it's broken. My heart is broken. Well, think about this. This is exactly how this surgery works that Stephen's going through. The bones are intentionally broken. Again, not out of hate. Not because that surgeon is mad at him. No, the bones are broken, and they want to do what God's kind of programmed them to do right away, which is try and fix it, try and fuse it right away. But see, this surgery, if all you wanted to do was just fix that bone and just go on the way things were before, then you say, well, what was the purpose of the breaking in the first place? It would be wasted. See, but it wasn't wasted because they didn't just set it and let it heal back and say, well, that was broken, but I'm done with that. No, see, if you want to lengthen the bone, if you want to lengthen the bone, which is what they were doing there, growth, well, you have to actually refuse to have it fuse right away, to turn those screws a little bit and go, ah, I don't like that. Not all at once. Again, God knows exactly how to have his hand on that screw, the exact amount that is to help and not hurt. Now, it's going to hurt some, but it's hurting to help. See, and you think about this, it was a fraction of a millimeter at a time, and the x-rays were being taken all the way along, and the doctor even at one point said, hey, slow down, just a quarter turn. We need it. He's watching it. He's got his eye on it. He knows exactly what he's doing on this, and this is the hard part, too. Along the way, Stephen isn't just sitting somewhere in a bed saying, wait on me while I wait for it to grow. No, the doctor said, you've got to walk on it to get it to grow. Now, always staying just slightly ahead of that process here. Now, what is the lesson? Again, not trying to gross anybody out, but the thing is progress in your life. It's a process, but it's a painful process. And it takes time, first of all, but it also takes the courage to walk on it while you're working through it. See, this is really important because the Christian life is compared to a walk. But in many ways, I would say, you know what it's like? It's like a walk on a broken leg. But with the Lord holding you up, giving you that stability ability. See, I'm always looking for a spiritual shortcut. Can't we just speed up this growth process a little, God? I mean, can't, can't I just kind of wake up with a longer, stronger faith? I mean, can't that just happen? You know, my life just be real impressive that way. And God says, well, I'm going to break it, and then you're going to walk on it. What? <laughs> are you sure? See, and when you think about this, the purpose of that frame, the pins, the rod, it's to make it load-bearing. It's to make his leg load-bearing. They could have just put it in a cast, but that wouldn't have worked. It would have atrophied. See, this is to make it possible for Stephen to walk, to put weight on the broken bone. Now, you would say, man, that's insanity. Well, but that's the thing. It's what it takes to make the bone grow. And it's what it takes to make the break worth it to have it actually do anything in our lives 
See, again, many people in the world broken. But when the Lord is saying, hey, I'm going to walk you through that brokenness, that's something that's amazing when that's happening. See, if all Stephen did was lay in his bed, there'd be no growth at the end of that. In fact, he'd be worse off than when it started. But with this painful process that he's going through here, there is progress. He's walking on it, adjusting it, listening to the surgeon, walking those things, not walking through it alone. And as painful as it is, again, that's what gives growth. The trust, you know, there's that trust factor. Is this thing really going to hold me up? I mean, you saw that gap. Yeah, it's really going to hold you up. The courage, is it going to hurt? Yeah, it's going to hurt more than a pinch. Will it help? Yes. And see, this is so huge, my friend, because the Christian life is often... Again, compared to that walk, a walk with Jesus, and you just have to remember, I hope for all time, that growth occurs in the broken places in your life. See, maybe you've had some broken relationships. Ah, growing pains. Maybe you've had some broke finances lately. The Lord says, growing pains. Broken health, growing pains. Growing old, growing pains. Broken pride. Oh, that's a big one. Self-sufficiency. Oh, growing pains. Where God says, we're going to have to get past that point. See? And spiritual birth comes at a point, and there's pain with that, certainly. But you know what? It's kind of only taking a moment. Ah, I like that pain. Oh, okay, we're done. You know, labor, even the worst labors, you know, as terrible as they are. I mean, I don't remember someone saying I had a 35-year uh, labor pains, you know, whoa, that's pretty bad. Uh, but you can have growing pains over a lifetime. And so God wants to lengthen and strengthen our faith. That's important to see. He doesn't want stunted growth spiritually in our life. And see, he knows progress is a process that takes time and some pain along the way, and it won't be easy, but it'll be worth it. And that brings us back to that verse again. Think it through with me as we read it. 1 Peter 2, verse 1. 1 Peter 2, verse 1, says, Therefore, laying aside all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil, evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. Now again, I want to be real clear on this. The Lord is gracious. You know, as you think about this, we do wonder sometimes. People ask it all the time. If God is good, if God is gracious, then why is my life so bad? Or why is life so bad? You know, looking around. Why is everything so hard? Why so much pain? Couldn't God just do something about that? But yeah, he's doing something through that. See, growing pains again. God cares more about our spiritual birth, first of all, and our spiritual growth, second of all. He cares way more about that than our physical comfort. Why? Because our physical comfort will come and go in maybe a hundred years if you last that long. But for all eternity, the growth that God gave will bear fruit. See, but God has to break us sometimes before he can build us. We have a lot of walls, I know. You know, facades, all those sort of things. But suffering has a way of just kind of clearing that out pretty fast, you know. Very quickly, <laughs> you're down to the basics, you know. There's something about suffering together that builds a bond like no other, really. If you've suffered together with somebody, well, it changes your relationship in so many ways. And I can say I'm closer to my son, in fact, closer to our whole family than I've ever been before after this time here. At the hospital, we spent a couple of the longest nights I've ever had together. And I must have lifted him about 20 different times, you know, for various reasons. It was up. And down, and a whole while, ah, 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 you know, that thing, fresh. A lot of, lot of challenges there. And holding him up, you know, and he's not that light anymore compared to what he was. And I'm not that strong anymore compared to what I once was. But it was really God holding both of us up and holding both of us close. And I'll never forget those nights at the hospital. Those were special times that built a bond. See, this is the thing to remember as you think about it. I can give great testimony to this. A time of great stressing in your life will also be a time of great blessing. See, it's like God turns the switch and says, man, that's some stress. Get ready with some bless. <laughs> you know, we're going to have to pour both of them on in abundance. And see, we laughed a lot there in spite of it. You know, it was laugh and cry, the combination of both. But God has a great sense of humor, and we love to look at these things as a family. Uh, if you look at this picture up here on the slide, I believe they have it. 
This was outside the window of Stephen's hospital room. And he looked at it and said, ow, bone pain. <laughs> now, I know you're supposed to pronounce that much more cultured than that, but for us, that will always be, ow, bone pain. And we got him a great sandwich from that place. You know, the hospital food was part of the pain. But man, we went to bone pain there and got a great, great sandwich. You know, it was also during March Madness. I said the surgery was during March, you know. Now, if you know what March Madness is, March Madness is the college basketball playoffs. And it's like 24-7. That's Stephen's heaven right there. I mean, 24-7 basketball. So right as he is... In this surgery, the doctor said, just lay there and watch TV. Ha, huh, I can do that. And he had a room that had two TVs, not picture in picture, picture and picture. You know, one here and one here. He had games going like this. You know, I'm not even sure. You know, he was kind of in a drug haze at the same time, too. <laughs> you know, I, I actually called the church here and told the pastor, hey, listen, the youth pastor, my, I think my son's on heavy drugs and he's really into body piercing. You know, okay, can you help me? But one of the games there went into six overtimes. It was totally crazy. It was over at something like 2.30 in the morning. But what do we care? <laughs> he doesn't have school. He doesn't have anything. Ah, watching basketball. Doctor's orders, you know. Now, that very morning in the hospital, the exact morning after the surgery, you know what? Lynn comes to the hospital. She's got an email. On that very day, she found out this, that Stephen had won an essay contest on why basketball meant so much to him and won the family four heat tickets that night. Wow! So he ended up going in, and right then, I'm telling you, it's like God turned a switch in our life that we look back and say, man, stressings, but blessings. You know, that actually led to the series of events that actually hooked our family up with one of Stephen's greatest heroes, which is Dwayne Wade and his father here today. Uh, honoring us with his presence here, Dwayne Wade Sr. Uh, God bless you. But just open, open up some opportunities for Stephen to speak at camps and all these types of things, just things that are beyond miracles if I gave you all the details of them, which I don't have time to do. But what I am going to do is give Stephen an opportunity to share with you directly. See, there, this has been six and a half hard months in our life. It has been. Our whole family growing closer together and growing some growing pains. And I even said, all right, Stephen, guess what you get to do Sunday? Ah, you know, I think it hurt more than the leg. <laughs> but I think about this, Bethany and Carissa, you know, they also have grown so much. Amazing nurses. They have had to put up with so much more, do all of his chores, you know. <laughs> That's about to come to an end, by the way. But the church family here, I just want to thank you for this. You know, most of all, God has been through us so much through the stressings with his blessings. And God will be here for you. God will be there for you through those things. Now, so many, again, of you have asked, how is Stephen doing? Well, I'm going to let you tell, I'm going to let him tell you in his own words. So I've asked him to come up here, and you're going to hear the same talk, the same basic talk that he gave in front of a, a bunch of kids at, at a Dwayne Wade senior basketball camp that he went to this summer. So, Stephen. Okay, I want you to know that this is not, I, I told the ushers beforehand, this is not a Kanye West moment. You know, do not... <laughs> He's not going to come up here and say, you know, I'm, I'm happy for you. I'm going to let you finish. But, you know, Pastor Pedro is the best preacher in the whole world. It's a, it's a, don't tackle him if he does that, you know. So let's see if we can do the logistics here. Well, just so you guys know, I'm Stephen, if you didn't know that already. Uh, <laughs> I want to talk with you guys about overcoming obstacles. Now, as you can see, I was born without fingers on my right hand, and also my right leg was several inches shorter than my left one. That's why I'm wearing this cage. It's actually called an Elizarov external fixator, so there you go. <laughs> um, my leg is being strengthened, but it's also being lengthened. It's a process that takes almost a year. 
And the la I actually have had three surgeries. This was the last of them. Uh, it happened in March, as my dad said. But they broke the bones in the leg. Then they screwed metal spikes into the bone. It has not only spikes, but wires that go all the way through the leg to stabilize it. But this is all to lengthen my leg. But the bones grow slowly. I have to walk on it, like dad said. I have to stretch it out so that my muscles don't just get all atrophied. And people always ask me, does it hurt? Yes, it does. But what hurts the most is not being able to play basketball. That's what I want to talk about overcoming obstacles because I have a disability, but I don't focus on my disability. I focus on my ability. I focus on what I can do, not on what I cannot do. One of my favorite Bible verses is Philippians 4.13, which says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. There is no dishonor in having a disability, and I won't let anyone diss my ability, but I don't want anyone's pity either. I will not use the obstacles I face as an excuse for having a pity party. I will practice harder, play harder, and push myself harder to keep getting better. One of the things that I find funny is that people judge me by appearance. They say, oh, look at this one-handed whitey with the limp. I don't want him on my team, you know? But what they don't know is that I don't just have a disability, I have an ability. God has done some amazing things in my life. Last season, I started on my varsity high school basketball team as a freshman, and I won Rookie of the Year. Um, I was one of the top scorers on the team, so. But when I first, the first day of practice for that season, I knew nobody. I just went out, I knew when the practice started, and when I first came out, I could tell. Everyone was like, oh no, not this guy. I mean, a handicapped kid, plus I'm homeschooled, so I didn't even go to the school. Uh, I mean, I'm just, they'd never seen me before. They're like, oh no, what's this guy doing here? But I started to warm up, and after they saw me shoot a few times, they're like, oh yeah, this is gonna be awesome. So it's true, I have a disability, but so do you. I also have an ability, so do you. Everyone has obstacles to overcome. Some are visible like mine. Some are less visible. I mean, maybe your obstacle is that you come from a poor neighborhood. Maybe people say you'll never amount to anything. Prove them wrong. Maybe your obstacle is that you have a learning disability and people think that you're dumb. Prove them wrong. Maybe people judge you because of the color of your skin or your family background. Prove them wrong. I know a lot of people who take one look at me and judge me. They say, oh, that kid can't be any good at basketball. I love to prove them wrong. With God's help, of course. Maybe your biggest disability is that you have a whole lot of ability, but not a lot of discipline. You're the best on your block, but you don't discipline yourself. You don't listen to the coaches or the teachers that God has put in your life. Maybe you are better than everyone else, but that's not the standard. Are you the best you can be? Everybody has obstacles, a disability, a hurdle. We face a choice. Let the obstacle overcome you or overcome the obstacle. Maybe some of you have heard of Jim Abbott. He was a major league baseball player. He won a gold medal in the Olympics. Uh, he played for the Yankees, the Angels, but he threw a no-hitter and he only had one arm. When he was a kid, he came home mad one time and told his dad, the kids won't let me play baseball because I only have one hand. But his dad replied, no, the kids won't let you play baseball because you stink at baseball. <laughs> you can't change the fact that you only have one hand, but you can change the fact that you stink. So his dad began to practice with him, and he got good. And soon the kids wanted him on their team, and then the major leagues wanted him on their team. He overcame obstacles. An interesting note about the no-hitter game was that it came right after one of the worst starts of his career. And it was against the same team, both games. It would have been easy for him to give up, but he didn't. He overcame obstacles. Another thing that teams would try to exploit his weak side. They would try to bunt to the side that, was, that he had a missing arm. But they never succeeded because he practiced and practiced fielding bunts to that side. A big mistake that a lot of people make is that they feel sorry for themselves. They expect others to feel sorry for themselves. 
but blaming the obstacles for your failures won't get you anywhere in life. With God's help, overcome the obstacle. Don't diss my ability and don't diss your disability. One of my favorite moments from this last season was we played a team that we had never played before. And when the game started, you could tell that they were dissing my disability. I mean, they, they double teamed our tallest player. They just were playing really soft on me. And they just, you could tell, they thought, what can this guy with one hand do? So they left me open for a three. I made that one. They left me open for another one. I made that one. Then they started to get frustrated, so they actually fouled me. I made both free throws. And they called timeout. And as we were in the huddle, I could hear the other coach yelling at his players about me. They went from not covering me at all to double teaming me. It's all about overcoming obstacles. The last six months have been extremely hard, just really hard for me and my family. But right now, I'm working on my mental game, you know, just getting tougher, wanting it more. Sometimes I go out to practice and there's no one out there to help me. I have to get my own rebounds and hobble along with the crutches, you know. But it's frustrating, but it makes me not want to miss, you know. I have to hobble a long way when I miss. So practice pays off, though. At several of the basketball camps, including one that Dwayne Wade Sr. did, I won the free throw contest. So my record is 28 in a row, one leg, one hand, but I'm overcoming obstacles. But the most important thing is that I'm not overcoming them alone. I have my faith in God. I have my family, my friends. Thank you to all of you who have prayed for me. But please remember, don't diss anybody's disability. Don't let anyone diss your disability. And if someone thinks you can't overcome the obstacles, with God's help, prove them wrong. I don't want to push this into the front row, so stop me there. <laughs> That's a hard act to follow. I did want to tell you guys that I got this little thorn in my foot a couple of uh, weeks ago, and I'm going to have to go see the doctor. I'm not getting this week, so if you could just pray for me. I'm not getting much sympathy at the house, you know, like, <laughs> it really hurts, you know. Yeah. Now, I wanted to show you a, a couple quick pictures and just close out with some thoughts. I, I put this one up now. Because I, didn't, I knew Stephen wouldn't come up here if I put it up here. But this is Stephen's first basket right there. You're going to kill me for that one. But that's Grandpa in the back there, uh, Grandpa Bill. And just uh, he made his first basket. And I'm telling you, from birth, this boy, I, I think he had a basketball for a brain. If you look close on the ultrasound, there are little black lines on it and the pebbles on his brain, you know. So... Just from that moment, I look at his face and I'm like, that kid has got some drive. So God has given him that. But I want to kind of close out with the last lesson here. Because, you know, this isn't to bring attention to my son or our words. It's to bring attention to God's son and his words. See, I want to talk with you just briefly about the love of a father for a son. See, honestly, facing this surgery, I think it was one of the most difficult things that Lynn and I have ever gone through, you know, as parents. I won't speak for Stephen, but I know this. I was scared. I was scared. Now, you know, you'd like to think, oh, he's a man of God. He's a man of faith. Listen, I was scared. One of the hardest things I've ever done in my life, to put your only son there on that gurney and watch him wheel him away knowing what was ahead for him, the waiting room that we were in, hours longer. It was already scheduled for hours, but it took hours longer than they expected and we expected, knowing what was going on somehow, but also not knowing everything that was going on and knowing, hey, they're breaking his leg. They're putting spikes through his leg. You know, and Stephen was under anesthesia at the time. You know, I knew that much. And I knew that the doctors and nurses were some of the best in the world there trying to minimize his pain. They had his best interest at heart. 
But when I, look at, when I think back to the pain that was on his face when he came out of the anesthesia and the look on his face, I will never, ever, ever forget it. I'll never forget that moment. Just the brutality of all that. And my thoughts so often that day and since went to Jesus and his suffering for me. No anesthesia. They beat him. They hurt him. Not to help him. They didn't want to minimize his pain. They were trying to maximize his pain. Spikes through his hands and feet. And even worse than that, the sin of the world placed upon him. And you think about that. What would lead a father to do that for his son? It really wasn't doing anything for his son. Well, the Bible says it was for you, that it was for me. It was because of his love for me. It was his pain, but my gain. And pain has a way of getting our attention. I think it does. You know, there's nothing like blood or something to make you go, I'm I'm awake, I'm alert, you know. And when Jesus went to the cross, again, it wasn't to correct his defect. He didn't have any. It wasn't to pay the price for his sin. He didn't have any. He had pain with a purpose, and he's promised us the same, that we would have pain, but with a purpose, eternal life. You know, we talked there about overcoming. The Bible says, in this world you will have trouble, but take courage, I have overcome the world. And Jesus said, how do you overcome the world? By faith. See, when I see Stephen with his crutches, I can't help but think what many people have said to me in my life about faith. Ah, That's just a crutch. You know, that's just a crutch for weak people. You know, Jesus is a crutch you lean on if you're not a tough person. You know what I say to that? Jesus isn't just a crutch in my life. He's the whole hospital. He is the whole hospital. And so he corrects defects. He does that inspection of the infection and the stability ability. And I remind you today that growth happens in the broken places. So as we come to a close, I want to go back to the beginning, which is that birth. That important insight out of the first chapter of 1 Peter, where he said plants and trees, they all grow. But like plants and trees, we all grow old. And the thing is, no matter how much growth we do in this life, you know, you think about this. The best a physical doctor can give you, the best surgeons in the world can give you birth, growth, death see there's that one obstacle that they can't seem to overcome the statistics still a hundred percent on that one with one exception in all of history which is jesus who rose from the grave and beat that obstacle overcame that obstacle and that's why only jesus can give us birth spiritually growth spiritually and life spiritually So we're going to close out. The band's going to come back. We're going to close out today. And I'm just going to give you an opportunity. If you're here in this room and you've heard these things and you say, you know what? The stuff that you've shared, the stuff that Stephen shared today, that's missing in my life. I don't have the stability ability. I don't have something to correct my defects. I know they're there. Well, that's when you need to do what the Bible says, which is it says to put your faith in him, to come to Christ with your problems. See, so many people think what I need to do is I'll, I'll fix myself up and then I'll get right with God. But the Bible says you'll never get yourself right. It's God who gets us right. It's a gift. But like all gifts, it must be received. And so I'm going to give you an opportunity. We're going to close our eyes. We're going to bow our heads. And I'm going to give you an opportunity here today to raise your hand to acknowledge your need. Now, you might say, why would I do that? What what am I doing by raising my hand? By raising your hand, you're saying, I want my sin forgiven. I know I'm a sinner. I want my sin forgiven. I want to know that at the end of this life, I'm going to go to heaven when I die. But even more than that, along the way, in the walk, I want to know that my brokenness, my pain has a purpose. I know that Jesus died for my sin. Well, the Bible says that to those who received him, to those who believe in him, he gives eternal life. So by raising your hand, what you're doing is acknowledging your need for that. So if you're here today with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, if you're here today and you want to acknowledge your need, I'm just going to ask you right now, wherever you're sitting, to go ahead and raise your hand in the seat. Go ahead and get it up now. 
If you're here today and you want to make that commitment, I see you there. God bless you. Anyone else? Get up high so I can see it. I'm an old man. I can barely see. God bless you. I see you over there, over here, all throughout the room. God bless you all. What I'm going to do is I'm going to lead you guys in a prayer. You who raised your hands, just pray this prayer after me. It's a prayer committing your life to God and know that He wants to give you that very birth and growth that we talked about here today. So repeat these words after me. God, I thank you for sending your son to die for my sin. I believe that Jesus died and rose again. And I want to follow him from this day forward. So I open my heart and Jesus, I ask you inside to be my Lord, to be my Savior, to be my friend. Wash me clean. I want to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. I'm going to ask you to do a bold move at this point. If you raised your hand, if you prayed that prayer to commit your life to Christ, I'm going to ask you, uh, the band here is going to close us out in a song, and as soon as they do, I'm going to ask you uh, to get up out of your seat and come right down here to the front. Now, you may say, why, why would I do that? That's embarrassing. That's difficult. Well, you know what? It can be. But as we talked about even today, you know what? Growth, there's part of that process. And one of the things that can happen in a person's life is, you know, they can have that secret faith, that hidden faith. But see, Jesus died for our sin publicly, and he says, hey, you know what? If you will acknowledge me before men, I'll acknowledge you before my Father. And so it was a very public death that he died. But that's what the Bible is calling us to, is that dying to the old self and alive to the new. So again, don't wait for somebody else to do it. Don't say, well, maybe some other time. It'll free you like you would not believe. But I think you will believe when you see what it does. So what's going to happen? People are going to cheer you on. They want you to come because they know what this meant in their life. And they know what it's going to mean in yours. Sometimes you got to walk on the broken things. So they're going to close us out in a song. All of us, let's rise to our feet. And if you prayed that prayer, you committed your life to Christ, come on down to this front. We'd love to give you a Bible and congratulate you on the best decision you've ever made. Yeah.